very great to have Dima here today. For those of you that don't know, Dima is actually the father of Vitalik. But let's learn more about him in today's sharing instead of just Vitalik's death. Dima, can you please help to introduce yourself and share more about yourself outside of being Vitalik death? Because this is what most people buy. Um, well, I grew up in the Soviet Union and uh, always was a kind of a geek, if you will. And I studied computer science uh, back in Russia. Uh, started my first, you know, I worked for a little bit uh, as a software engineer. Then I started my first business, which was uh, 94 years ago. And um, and yeah, basically, ever since then, I've been an uh, entrepreneur in uh, tech, in software specifically. And I moved to Canada uh, 22 years ago. So I've been living in Toronto ever since. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm in crypto, if you will, somewhat superficially. I'm involved in various projects in different ways. I'm, I don't currently have... Uh, full-time job. I do things like angel investing, advising, mentoring, coaching, things like that. I have one one of the projects I'm involved in. It's called bloggeeks.com. It's an educational project about blockchain. So I have a lot of curiosity. That's my essence. And I uh, crypto, I think, is the, the biggest uh, uh, development in technology in the last couple of decades. So I'm trying to stay involved and of course uh, especially because uh, of uh, my son's ethereum creation and ethereum community is where i i'm more plugged in than other blockchain communities so that's kind of high level picture about me awesome thank you so much for sharing so just curious right if uh, before Vitalik founded Ethereum, were you already involved in the space? And when you created Block Geeks, which is the blockchain education platform, was it also something that you have done because like after Ethereum and then you wanted to educate more people or did they, all this initiative come before Vitalik founded Ethereum? Uh, I did buy my first Bitcoin, I think it was in 2012. And it was me who told Vitalik about Bitcoin, right? I so see. kind of that's how it all started. But I was not involved uh, uh, until Blog Geeks. I was involved very superficially because my I was busy with you know basically raising children and and building my other businesses, which were in software, but not specifically cryptocurrency related. But also uh, when I co-founded Blog Geeks, uh, it was kind of opportunistic, not so much related to Vitalik and his creation, but a few things came together. First, like uh, there was this uh, uh, awesome guy who is my friend and uh, he's a co-founder of this, uh, Amir, and uh, he came up with their original idea and uh, kind of we started the business together. And my life experience also that starting any kind of project initiative business is much easier when you, when you have uh, partners who provide complementary skills when you're not doing it on your own. And secondly, this whole crypto decentralized space is very much aligned with my philosophy, uh, philosophy of kind of personal freedom, self-sovereignty, privacy, and whatnot. So I, uh, probably that's related to uh, me growing up in Soviet Union, and I saw exactly how big government works, and it actually does not work. So so for me, this whole movement, uh, decentralized movement, is uh, 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 it's very uh, important, if you will, for their development of humanity toward more just, more fair, more free society, if you will. Awesome. So this is like a utopian point of view for crypto. And just curious, because right now, if we see the blockchain and crypto market, right, we see a lot of businesses implementing blockchain crypto, not because of the initial principle. For example, yes. recently, central bank digital currency, they have been super yes. um, hot. And personally, I because I also um, deal with blockchain education, we have been preaching or sharing about the importance of self-sovereign, importance of decentralized cryptocurrencies. And then with things mm -hmm. like CBDC, don't you find it like, even though this is not the tenets of cryptocurrency Bitcoin, but this is what society is moving towards this is what governments are going to do 
So what are your point of view regarding all this new initiative that may actually break from the initial tenets but could be still useful in a society? Well, it's not something that we can control, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, there is uh, some invention happens and then everybody around and they trying to figure it out and uh, see how that applies to what they do, right? And big corporations jump on the bandwagon. They try to create their own private blockchains and <laughs> semi-private blockchains. And that doesn't seem to be really going anywhere. And then central banks, they kind of, want to use their blockchain technology to to do whatever they do and that's fine you know they're all fine experiments but that's not something that excites me right and i think that when i look at their rate of development of their blockchain space it keeps accelerating and there is so much so much stuff happening you know first we had the foundational blockchain platform uh now we, uh, over the last, let's say, couple of years, DeFi has become a really big deal. Now we're talking about NFTs, then uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. There's so much experimentation and stuff and, you know, the privacy coins and, yeah. you know, yeah. other stuff. So I think that uh, technology will keep moving forward. And I think that this has now become a huge movement, which is not, you know, based in a specific country, but, you know, people all over the world kind of, get together, collaborate, create stuff. And in the meantime, if you will, old school structures, they all try to like, oh, what is this? <laughs> uh, what do we do with that? How can we maybe use it or whatever? And uh, that's fine. This is life. But for me, that's the least interesting part of uh, what's happening. And uh, I think that they will keep running way behind just because all the brightest minds and the excitement is not there. Interesting. So with this, uh, Dimitri, you mentioned a lot of things like NFT, crypto, centralization, decentralization, privacy coins. Can you help to sum up in a sentence? What do you think is this crypto blockchain movement, especially for people super new to this space? For me, it's about uh, maybe two things. It's about self uh, sense of self-sovereignty that every human being can now have full control of their own assets without any intermediaries like banks and governments. And, uh, and also they cannot be censored, right? It's like lack of censorship that uh, now every human being where they are in the world, in Pakistan and Singapore in Toronto, anywhere, if they have internet connection, they can connect and they can participate in this new emerging organizations, uh, DAOs, they can participate in a project, they can make money, and that money is there. So, you know, they have all those banks and intermediaries, you know, trying to take a percentage of that. So I think that's that self-sovereignty and then uh, lack of censorship are uh, two kind of main big uh, themes of this whole movement for me. Awesome. So it's like freedom for the people. We own our real own money. Don't need to depend on others. Yes. Decentralization. And you know, like freedom. Movement. Yes. Um, and it's very interesting because it's also, it's a big mental shift for many people because many people uh, live in, in many countries, uh, they they have learned this uh, way to be, oh, like the state will take care of me, right? Like, you know, um, you know, this expression, nanny state, when the state becomes like your nanny, like you're a child and they are your nanny. Uh, and with blockchain, it's very different, right? You get full direct uh, control of their digital of your nfts or whatever but let's say for example that you mess up and you mess up with some security aspects so you lose your password and you can lose it all right so you have full freedom but also you have uh full uh responsibility if you will right and that's that's a big shift for many people so kind of like a uh, big mental shift that uh and that's always the case because we we humans we think that we always want more freedom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, like, how do we make that freedom uh, uh, more, mm, like, maybe friendly, right? So that because it's very natural for people to be bad about security, it's natural for people to forget their passwords. So the question is for me is how do we build those technologies in a way that they uh, support, you know, that they can exist and can be used even in light of this, uh, of all common human weaknesses, right? 
True, I completely agree with you. Like some of my friends or people I meet, when I talk about crypto, they'll be like, they don't want to be responsible for their own funds. So some people, they right. don't actually want that freedom, which is very interesting because yeah. for some of us, we expect that everyone, we want to own our own money, we want to be our own bank, but this is not the case. And since crypto, yeah. we are still relatively young. So I'm assuming that in the future, when the UI, the UX, the projects improve, maybe people will be more open to trying this new system. Because right now, sure. onboarding, the wallets, all the UI, yeah. UX, not yeah. so advanced, not so user-friendly yet. Yes. Right. It's much better than, than it was like four or five years ago. And there's some really cool experimentation with like social recovery wallets and other stuff. But yeah. we're still very early. It's still very easy to make a mistake. You know, the system is slow and expensive. Like any other new technology, you know, like I have mm. a, I've seen how the internet was emerging right and uh, initially it was very slow and ugly and hard to use and now we use that every day so i think the same will is happening with blockchain technologies yes i think we are still at the 1990s but it's a good thing because if people come in a space means that we are still considered kind of early early yes. adopters so this means that this space has even more room to grow and develop as yes. well which is very, very interesting. Absolutely. So look mm -hmm. forward to that as well. And yeah. Dima, let me ask you a question. Try not to be biased because you are Vitalik's debt. All right. <laughs> so are you chain agnostic or Ethereum for life? Would you consider well, well, utilizing other chains or mostly just Ethereum? You think it's enough or what so do you the think? The thing is like... Uh, we all have our biases, right? And because of our biases, then we have our filters and those filters, they create a certain picture, right? Uh, so I'm observing other blockchains and I'm potentially open to, I'm, I'm kind of, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with some blockchains like uh, uh, Avalanche and uh, Algorand and Solana and whatnot. Uh, I'm more plugged in and I have more connections in the Ethereum space. And I can see that the Ethereum community is uh, much bigger and stronger. And also what I, I kind of, it feels differently to me because when I look at some other, you know, blockchains, some of them, they seem to be built about technology. Like, oh, let's make it, it's more sophisticated, it's faster, which is wonderful. You know, technologies are about that. Some of them are about like Solana. It feels to me like, there's, oh, we can make more money here. That's fine too, yeah. right? Because making money, creating new technologies, it's all, they're all great aspects of uh, humanity. But uh, Ethereum feels differently to me. There is a lot of like, you know, people having fun. Also pe people running very, a lot of uh, uh, passionate projects where trying to create, you know, that proof of humanity, this, the universal basic income mm. and uh, uh so many other initiatives in this space, like Lobby Lobsters and FT. I don't know if you've encountered that. That's a attempt for their community, crypto community to uh, uh, influence their government regulations. And so many awesome projects driven by desire of people to create something better. So, so for me, that resonates the most, right? And the question is like, will Ethereum succeed, uh, you know, and what will happen to other technologies, I really have no clue. Like, it sounds to me like Ethereum definitely had a lot of challenges because it was the first one, right? And it was a trailblazer and there were lots of things that had to work on. I'm quite excited to, to see their uh, transition to proof of stake, uh, hopefully early next year. For me, that's a big deal because again, Bitcoin was the original invention and, you know, uh, and, and it's beautiful in many ways. But it feels to me like Bitcoin is has got really stuck in a like oh our technology is perfect and should never be changed and this is not how technologies work. Like I can guarantee you, eventually there will be something more and better than Ethereum. Like when that will be, like in ten years, five years, twenty years, who knows, right? But uh, this is the way the world works. You know, we first had H we had HTML websites, and we had JavaScript, and there were many other experimentations. I don't know if you remember Flash and Silverlight and so many other things. And uh, technologies will keep evolving, right? And for us uh, people involved in these technologies, it's really about uh, where do we where do we feel we can contribute the most, or where does it resonate with us emotionally? Interesting. Thank you, Dima, for the sharing. So just like you mentioned some very interesting point, like how a lot of 
blockchains now, if you look at the use case, they are more financial. It's about more yeah. yield farming, more DeFi. And then a lot of it personally just feels to me like a money-making scheme. So imagine a scenario yes. whereby if tokens are not denominated in fiat, meaning that you cannot compare tokens mm -hmm. to fiat, what do you think will yeah. happen? Because personally, I would think we wouldn't have so much attention in this space. There won't be maybe so many participants because cryptocurrency, the pricing aspect is kind of what makes this technology more sexy in a sense, especially for non-technical people. For sure. Right? It's very natural to, <laughs> yeah. for that to be the case, yes. So what do you think yeah. we can do more for education in this case to kind of make people more interested in the underlying technology? Because this is what personally for blockchain education, I think we are yeah. facing. People just want to know how yeah. to make money. How can we change that yeah. and how can we start? Do you have any like suggestions? We don't have to change that, but yeah. I would say what we can do, we can just, uh, if you will open the eyes and tell them, hey guys, there are so many different ways you can play with this technology, right? And that's what I personally find is like when people eventually start actually doing stuff about this, uh, then things uh, uh, start to shift. Like for example, for myself, I've never been a collector and the whole NFT trend was like, oh, what is that? I don't quite understand that. It seems interesting. Lots of people involved. And then a few weeks ago, I uh, eventually tried it out. And I'm like, oh, I like this. This is fun. Uh, the community is fun. And the art is fun. And, you know, the sense of owning this particular digital asset is interesting, right? And like, you know, last couple of days, I, I found this project called Evil Teddy Bears uh, and EvilTeddyBears.com, and, and I've just been minting them, and they look cute, and there's a community, like, and it's just a lot of fun, right? So for me, education is uh, uh, any kind of education, blockchain or others, right? Like, you know, that's uh, where we quite often fail because we try to tell people you should do this, and it's all yeah. very serious. It's like you know, try to remember this facts. Well, education should be fun. Education should be more like a game. Like, you know, I love learning languages and there's an app called Duolingo, if you know that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's like a game, you know, you, you learn languages, you get points, you get this little rewards and all of that. So any kind of education, the more we can uh, connect with the natural desire of people to learn, to be curious, to play, the, the better off we are, right? And even defy stuff. Again, it's yeah. like, Let's not be too serious, like, oh, I'm going in and, you know, I'm going to make tons of money. Well, maybe you will, maybe you will lose a lot of money, right? So what are the ways that you can start playing with that so you can understand a little bit what's going on? So yeah, make it playful, make it easy, make it fun. Make awesome. It a game. Completely agree. And this is what we see in Twitter as well. Instead of human, you know, with all the serious profile pic, we have so many cute uh, animals, uh, pudgy yeah. penguins, and then everyone just having yeah. fun. We are not like... Uh, exactly. Uh, binding ourselves to anything so that's awesome as well speaking of mm -hmm. nft just a fun question if you have to change your nft uh, sorry your profile picture what would you change it to which nft would you change it to <laughs> just for fun not about a value yeah <laughs> it's it, it's hard to say because i uh, now that i play with them there are so many interesting projects and i love you know so many of them from budget bank uh, you know penguins, penguins to lazy lions <laughs> to based robots yeah. to die die ninjas and metaverse guardians but i have to say that uh, at least like uh, recently that uh, project that i mentioned uh evil uh, teddy bears and mm -hmm. they have a companion that's called creepy kid I, I really like the art for me it resonates it's it's fun it's creepy it's not too scary if you will <laughs> and that's like uh like for me it's uh, connects with my uh sense of being a child you know playful mm -hmm. curious a little bit like oh it's a little bit scary and here's the blood and the knife and whatever but i love that awesome dima just to uh just curious just want to ask like if you talk to your friends outside of crypto about crypto and then you talk to them about this nft or you show them the cartoon <laughs> what is their normal reaction and do you like even bother to share with them more or like try to slant their point of view because personally let's say if i talk to someone outside of crypto and then i talk about look at this pudgy penguin i'm going to buy sushi yeah. tomorrow they'll be like what are you talking about <laughs> mm. so yeah. um, what do you think like what are your thoughts on this and then how or should we even try to you know bring the normies in you know what, like, I would say do that, but without an expectation and attachment to this, right? Yeah. Because like, for example, <laughs> on my Instagram and on Facebook, I just replace my profile with uh, one of my uh, NFTs 
Oh, I post maybe some pictures on Instagram. I don't even comment. I don't tell them, oh, check mm. out this project. Yeah. You're free, there you are. It's more like, hey, this is this. And then people are like, oh, what is this? This is interesting. If somebody is interested, then I, you know, point them to, to that particular project and we can discuss this. But it's, again, how can I share like, oh, this is fun. You know, hey, guys, check this out. This looks interesting, right? Uh, if they interested, then I can point them to more information. And this relates to NFTs. This can relate to DeFi too, right? I can point them to a particular, hey guys, this is very easy to do this. Check out yeah. this wallet or whatever. Like, but again, there was no expectation that they should be doing this because mm. uh, every human person knows, you know, they will come into this when it's time for them to do that. True. And I think potentially in the future or in the next few months, NFT could be the uh, point of entry because it's something cute yes. you know when you buy a coin Absolutely, normally yeah. if i buy ethereum it's like oh it's just a cryptocurrency yeah. but imagine if i buy like a penguin a cute penguin so this will really absolutely. attract everyone here so i think, I think this is absolutely. a very mm, mm -hmm. I think it's a very and interesting. I think that point. level two is making a big difference because right now, like minting, doing stuff with NFTs is very expensive, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that kind of like uh, uh, it's a big barrier to entry. But as the new level twos are launching and it's becoming much easier and very inexpensive to do this, like so those uh, evil teddy bears that I mentioned, I got a whole bunch of them. Like, you know what? <laughs> I would love to actually send them to a bunch of my yeah. friends. I showed them to my kids, you know, to my two daughters. Uh, yeah. And they, they love that. Uh, so like actually, as soon as uh, it's, uh, it's not too much hassle and cost to do that. So I think that as uh, people working on the user experience and bring down the cost, then it actually will become very attractive, very easy, right? And like, hey, check this out. And then also as games emerge from that, right? So it's not just like a, a picture or whatever, but then you can do something, right? And you look at success of something, something like uh, Axie Infinity. That's a very interesting project, right? So mm -hmm. I think that uh, this is where we see a lot of... Uh, a lot more people enter into the space than just purely through like defined complicated stuff. Very true. I think like this is potentially what we can do for more adoption and mass adoption in yeah. the future as well. But who knows? Mm -hmm. The crypto scene yeah. is always evolving. This month is about yeah. NFT. I think next month is about layer two because recently yeah. layer two yeah. have been making a, no a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe the following I month, think, mm -hmm. don't know what will happen. <laughs> so that's what makes this I think space Decentralized exciting. social media will be one of the big next kind of waves and we will see when it finally gets the traction, right? But many mm. people are not happy with all the censorship and, and whatnot and major platforms. So yeah, I know there are a whole bunch of projects happening in the space, people trying to build, if you will, better Twitter. Uh, yeah, so that's so exciting. Awesome. So we'll have a lot to look forward to in the future as well. Who knows what will happen yeah. because this space is really crazy. Yeah. Every, day, every day, new news, new project, a new trend as well. So let's yeah. see what happened next <laughs> and mm -hmm. with this Dima I just want to ask you a uh, next question for developers meaning uh, people who know programming they develop apps and everything what would be your advice to them if they are looking into stepping into the blockchain space uh, my advice to them mm -hmm. would be is to look into DAOs DAOs because right now there are so many awesome uh, and DAOs are basically new type of organizations when people, instead of creating startups, companies, whatnot, they create this decentralized, you can think of them as decentralized uh, cooperatives, uh, mm. decentralized groups. And then some of them, they focus on building games. Some of them, they focus on investing in stuff and whatnot. And, and uh, they actually now have lots of uh, really cool tools. This is how they vote. This is how they do governance. This is how they organize development work. And this is how they communicate and so on. So uh, lots of those organizations are looking for uh, people. So you can always raise your hand and volunteer and say, you know, look at, you know, the top uh, DAOs, DAOs, uh, see if, uh, what are they doing? If, uh, if the goal of that particular organization uh, resonates with you, then try to volunteer, try to like say, hey, you know what, I can do this for you. Maybe I can organize this. Maybe I can do this deployment. Maybe I can try to write this little piece of code. Maybe I can do the front end for this website, right? So it's really about doing something hands-on because mm -hmm. you can keep learning and there are lots of materials online and videos and code examples and all kinds of stuff. You can keep learning forever, right? But it's like some people, they get stuck in, in the education system and they get, you know, 
the bachelor's degree and master's degree and PhD and whatnot. Yeah. And you can keep learning and learning is fun, right? But for me, uh, their best learning happens in real life, right? And uh, if you guys uh, remember Vitalik, he went into a really awesome computer science university, but then he dropped out after one year and then he ended up inventing the theorem. And I'm not saying that people should or should not go into university, but I'm saying that when he brought up, he said uh, to, to myself and uh, other people, he said, oh, I'm thinking of dropping out. And I said, you know what? I think this is awesome because I, I, I <laughs> believe that you will be, uh, there is no way that you would not, that you would stop learning, right? But in doing stuff, you will learn so much more than just kind of being in this isolated environment and learning just more knowledge. So knowledge is not abstract. The best knowledge is really applied. So really that's kind of my high level advice is find a way to get involved in a, on a practical level and that can happen for people at you know every level of uh, whatever they level of are they technical non-technical what's the level of seniority are, are they a designer are they just a good project manager any kind of person can can benefit from that true completely agree as well and as a developer imagining as a newbie when i look in the crypto space i would think wow there's so many blockchain and each blockchain, yeah. you need to learn a different language. And then you can think to what to develop. Like you want to develop like a financial debt or something related to gaming, something related to yeah. uh, compliance, KYC. There's so many choices. So how can we actually, you know, um, focus more? Like how can developers try to, We I would say, pick their poison or choose whatever they think mm. it's the most interesting yeah. because too many information information overload if you if you look yeah. closely you will actually see that most blockchains ended up uh using the the architecture developed by ethereum it's called ethereum virtual machine evm mm -hmm. right so this is the safest bet you know if you because the, if you learn the language, the solidity, and then they learn their kind of this whole concept of uh, if you're in virtual machine, then this can be applied to Binance Smart Chain, can be applied to whatever your heart desires. So that would be, I think that's their very, a very safe starting point. But you know, if not, just look at a few of them and kind of, if something feels right to you, follow your heart. I'm always a big believer in like following your heart because if something is interesting to you, it's much more likely that you will succeed in pursuing that versus if you tell yourself, well, I've done my careful analysis and it looks yeah. like the best, you know, the highest potential is here. Well, you know what? Your heart will, will support your journey much better than your mind will kind of tell you like, oh, I should go into finance. Well, you know what? Maybe not. There are lots of awesome finance projects, but maybe you want to play with loot and NFTs and budget penguins and whatever else. Awesome. So for developers, for example, for now in this space, developers are high in demand. And one of the problems yeah. is more of like a lot of developers, they don't even know about crypto. They don't know how mm -hmm. fun it is in this space. So yeah. what do you think we can do to kind of grow awareness? Because if people don't know about this space, how can they even try? And if they don't try, they don't know how awesome it is. You know what, I think that now we really get into the stage when there's a lot of media, right? And there are a lot of uh, articles about uh, and podcasts about this stuff. So there's no lack of uh, information, right? And uh, if people into podcasts, for example, I would definitely recommend uh, one particular awesome podcast. It's called Bankless. Mm -hmm. So amazing podcast. And like find the way that you like to learn uh, and the and then kind of start from there, right? And uh, but in the meantime, it's not like uh, we have to rush and get many more people involved. Uh, uh, let's think about creating better user experience. Let's think about creating, you know, playful games, fun ways for people to get involved, right? And and developers uh, then they can look for ways to get involved in those things, uh, matching to their specific skills and whatnot there is no lack of information it's really about them like finding something that really piques their interest right and you know maybe mm -hmm. they still have their job for now but they can learn about this they can find an area which is uh which feels like they have personal interest in that and they can try to play with it a little bit and then from that little bit a little bit more will happen and so on so it's more i guess my long answer there boils down to very simple point start somewhere start somewhere in the practical way and then you'll go from there awesome and just try as well 
try yeah. out everything in crypto and DeFi, even if you yeah. get rug pull or anything, it's part of the learning experience. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Just to try. Definitely. Yeah. Don't, don't mortgage your house. <laughs> don't put all of your of savings, course. right? Yeah. And, um, you know, be careful. Like people new to this space, I say, you know what? Like, you know, maybe not put more than 10% of your net worth into this space until you really understand that, right? But play with that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dima, for the sharing. And to end off this sharing, uh, can you help to sum all this up in one sentence? What is your crypto philosophy? Just now you kind of mentioned, but maybe uh, yes. just to share again. Yes. Um, I'll summarize it in this way. I think that we're witnessing a huge, huge shift in the way it's technological shift, but it's technological shift that, lead, that will lead to major changes in our society, right? Based on the decentralized trust. And uh, their concept of self sovereignty, lack of censorship. So we are witnessing this major shift. And I hope that more people, we're still very early, but more people will now find a way to learn about this and try this and play with that and experiment with that and onboard this. And there's a lot of exciting stuff going to happen in the next decade, two decades. Awesome. Nicely sum up. So basically, everyone to just have fun, just try. Uh, take a chance in this space as well. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So thank you so much, Dima, for uh, sharing. So very interesting thoughts, very interesting uh, views on how we can advance blockchain education as well. Thank you. Good talking to you. Take care. Awesome. And last fellow question for fun. My own yeah. question. Why is there something yeah. instead of nothing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a deep question, right? Yeah. And the point so is like, when when you think there is something like, you know, Let's say you look at a chair, right? And as a human being, you know it's a chair because it's something that you can sit on and so on. But think about this. If you're a fly, as a fly, or, you know, you, you, you don't care about chairs. You don't need to set, sit on the chair. So a fly probably has a very different interface to reality than human brain has. So we typically live in this space time and we think that what we see is the reality, the actual no. reality. I don't think that's yeah, the case. I think true. this is more like the way our brain compresses reality for uh, into a structure that's uh, useful for this kind of, for a human being to survive. But if you think from a perspective of a different uh, animated object, like a moth or a dog or whatever, they would see the world totally differently, right? Because if you think about this, every object in, in, our, in our mind is like, we kind of live in our own VR and every object yeah. is created from a perspective. What does this object mean for me, right? But uh, for a different human already, this object would mean something different. And for a different animal, it would mean something totally different, right? So when you go deep into that, then you realize that every object there, what it means, is not in the object, but it's in your own mind that has created the structure of your world. So really this object is nothing. And this object then becomes something when it's, uh, when it's viewed by you. You know, a dog looks at the same object, looks something totally different. You know, a moth, a fly sees something different. So that's like, it's all nothing, but from a particular perspective, then it becomes something and something else. A different human looks at this and say, oh, blockchain is bad, you know, whatever. NFTs suck, they burn energy, whatever, right? So really, but that's the point, that there is nothing, but it becomes something in our perception of that. Why is that even perception? Like, so weird. <laughs> yes, and, you know, that's so another even deeper have question. Something, yeah. But uh, I would say that <laughs> the way I think about this, that here's the world. And, and there are humans, and humans are basically modeling engines. So human brain structures, they just create their models of the world, you know, and they are very simplified abstract models because the world is infinite and huge, right? And the mind is like a chair, a human, a tree. But, you know, what is a tree? It's like all those leaves and branches and things, and there is no tree similar to each other, you know? So um, it's... Uh, how to put this the way i think about this is like it's like just big quantum soup and the soup is floating and things are changing and within the soup we have these beings we call you know these structures we call human beings yeah. and human beings as natural aspect of the existence they just model the world and actually i think this 
modeling of the world is actually the process when perception happens and then you have the illusion, oh, here's me and I'm seeing this object, right? So object, seeing this object and you as a, something that sees this object, they all arise together. But that's really just part of the natural process of a human being modeling this quantum soup. That, that's how I think about it. So do you think we are walking mid-backs? <laughs> Pretty much. Right. Yeah. 